destined for fame. Do for the fam, not for the grand. Stunt me, you're destined for pain. I do not front, I do not scam. Put some respect on my name. Sick like a bang, click and I bang. Y'all gon' remember the name. Y'all gon' remember the name. What's up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world? I would like to welcome you back to the Real Talk with Zuby podcast. On today's episode, we have got on Adam Coleman who is the author of the new book, Black Victim to Black Victor, and he is also the founder of Wrong Speak Publishing. Welcome to the show, Adam. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. I appreciate no doubt, it. bro. So uh, that's a brief intro right there, but tell people a little bit about who you are and what you do. And in many ways, I'm just an average guy. You know, by day, I, I work in IT, uh, but also uh, after work, you know, I'm interested in the culture war and just the world around me. I'm 36 years old and I've had a bunch of up and down, ups and downs throughout my life. And I wanted a way to kind of express how I felt personally, uh, how I felt uh, somewhat politically, culturally. And I started writing a book and it took me about 10 months or so to complete it. And it was my first attempt to really even try to write a book. So uh, it was a great experience. Awesome, man. And the title of the book is, it's its fairly provocative. It's a powerful title, Black Victim yeah. to Black Victor. There's sort of a lot in there. So why did you decide to call the book that? The book is not one thing. There's a lot of different things that are extremely important that I find uh, victimhood is something that I highlight because right now it seems like, regardless if it's Black Americans or anybody, uh, victimhood is a currency that people you know love to obtain. So I wanted to dismantle the idea of victimhood as far as being beneficial. I wanted to highlight individualism. Uh, I wanted to highlight uh, you know accountability, responsibility. These are all extremely positive things to, to take into account in your personal life. And it goes from your personal life and extrapolates out into how you see the world uh, and even into the political realm. So I especially wanted to highlight the black victim part because I started writing shortly after the death of George Floyd. And it portrayed American society for Blacks as if we are the perpetual victims. And my perspective is that Black Americans are victors in many ways. Anytime you look at any society and they were oppressed and nobody argues that, they're able to come out from the other side. In many ways, they're the victors, they're the overcomers. And so that's what I wanted to really highlight, that it's how you view things. All the things that you know people say could be absolutely true. There could be white supremacy and all these particular things that are happening in the, in the world, but it's how you perceive things. How do you move forward? How do you overcome it? Do you just way for someone to fix all your problems or do you do something for yourself and so that's kind of why i i focused on it and and ultimately the the title is a positive about being a victor in the long run and so in many ways i'm talking about culturally as far as black victims but i also lace in my personal story where i personally felt like a victim at times i talk about my childhood growing up in a single parent home uh, an absent father i'm critical of my family my upbringing i'm critical of myself i try to be fair and i try to be in many ways like emotionless as you're reading it so i just, I just wanted to be matter of fact because there's a lot of ways there's too much emotion that's going on in the world so i just wanted to express it in a way that seemed like a healthy dialogue but critical you know not absolving anybody if anything and trying to be as honest from my perspective as honest as i possibly could about the world around me no doubt man well that that's powerful man there's a, there's a lot there i'd like to go into your own story a little yeah. bit. You said at times you yourself felt like a victim and you've been through a lot of experiences and perhaps trials and tribulations and talking different different people and seeing different perspectives that has led you to where you are right now, where you're talking more about accountability and personal responsibility and all that. So right. for myself and all the listeners, tell us a little bit more about your upbringing, your childhood. What is it? What's the story that led you to this point? So basically, you know, I like I said before, I grew up with my, my mother and my sister. I was born in Detroit. We had left Detroit around when I was about five years old. My father was in Detroit. My father just to be frank, my father was a married man and not to my mother. So that already created somewhat of a riff. And then us moving a lot, I didn't really hear from him. I would rarely see him. Usually I would see him when he just happened to be in town because uh, he he was a, a tailor. So he would sometimes travel to like New York City, for example, to, to get fabrics. But he would stop. He would stop by our house during the travel. So I would see him very seldomly. I would get maybe like one or two phone calls. And it was always strange because uh, it was like talking to a stranger 
stranger. I had no real connection with my father. You know, it was extremely difficult as a man to understand what it is to be a man, especially when you're a kid, you're trying to figure things out. I didn't really grow up around any men, to be honest with you. Uh, we moved around a lot. My mom didn't really have a bunch of relationships. So I never had like a stepfather or, or any strong male influence. So in a lot of ways, I was what I call in the book, a lost boy trying to figure out the world and not having his father as a compass throughout life. It makes things extremely difficult. There were times that we were homeless. We were homeless a couple of times. And, you know, sometimes when we talk about homelessness, we just think people sleeping on the streets or, you know, something like that. But homelessness comes in a bunch of different ways. Uh, you know, we were bouncing in and out of hotels at one point. You know, we stayed with a stranger at one point just to try to have some place to stay. Meanwhile, my mother is working full time. She's doing the best that she could. So it's not it's not the fault of my mother. You know, there's a bunch of different circumstances that led to each one. There was one incident where we did stay at a homeless shelter. And I, I remember those days vividly. So, and, you know, it's weird because we were staying in a homeless shelter. Meanwhile, my mom is a nurse and she's going to, to work every day and we're going to school every day. So it's a, it's a weird reality to experience, even if it's temporary. We had moved to four states by the time I was 18. And within those states, we moved a number of times. So a lot of my life was very inconsistent. I was almost like nomadic at times. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people have like childhood friends. I have high school friends. So um, coming from that particular childhood was difficult. And then I became a young father, uh, you know, relatively, I was 21 years old when my son was born. So not knowing what a man was, and now I have a boy and I have to teach him how to be a man. It's extremely difficult. It's daunting. But one thing I knew is that I didn't want to be my father. So a lot of my book is opening up so my son can read the book. And he's 15 years old now, and he's actually reading the book. And he understands my perspective. He understands why I do certain things or why I move a particular way. And we've, I mean, before the book, I, you know, I, I was always open with my son and told him about my upbringing, but he's now reading the emotional side. And I'm being very detailed as to what my childhood was like. And he actually told me how reading the book made him more appreciative of his upbringing. And so I, that's something that, that was one of the goals of the book, because I did want to leave something behind for him to be proud of and to remember and for him to understand his father, because I never got to understand mine. Man, I understand that. That's, there's a lot there. Yeah. At that time when you were growing up through your childhood, how would you have described your mentality at that time? Were you feeling like the world was against you or that things were unfair? Are you able to kind of go back in that mind state and think about, okay, how were you viewing the world and your circumstances? So I'll mention racially. Racially, I tended to see people for who they were. When we moved around a lot, we, a lot of times we moved in predominantly white neighborhoods and even some rural areas. So at one point I was in a middle school and I was one of four black kids in the entire school. When you look at that from the outside, you're like, wow, he, he must have felt completely different. But I felt very accepted, you know, within that area. So, you know, it wasn't I was looking for white acceptance. I was just looking for acceptance from people just in general. My particular upbringing within these uh, in these schools and, and seeing the world in that way, it shaped how I just started seeing people for who they were. Later on in like my high school years, uh, you know, I started being around more diverse crowds and that was kind of difficult. But as far as like feeling like a victim and, and what was me, there were times where I was, you know, missing, missing my father and wanting him to be there. And I had trouble in, in high school and a lot of it stemmed from what was going on at home. You know, to be honest with you, I barely graduated from high school. It was extremely difficult for me. I had, uh, you know, I would say I probably had a learning disability, uh, dyslexia that was undiagnosed. But, you know, if you read through all the, the symptoms of it, it, it sounds just like me in high school. So I struggled a lot and uh, I didn't really have an outlet. I didn't really have anybody advocating for me. My mother did the best that she could, but she's also working a lot. So these particular situations made it extremely difficult to, to kind of navigate the world and, and uh, figure things out for myself as a, as a young man. I would say there were there were definitely times as an adult where I was kind of woe is me and, and extreme depression, moments of feeling suicidal, but I kept going. And some of the influences for me to keep going had to do with my son because I didn't want to fail my son and uh, looking at my mother uh, because my mother kept going. My mother had plenty of opportunities to sit back and let the government take care of her, but she didn't do that. And so that was, that was something that always stuck with me. I, 
I, like just giving up didn't feel like an option to be honest with you okay man no there's a lot there man there's a yeah. lot there i mean well firstly i want to say congratulations for reaching where you are right now right thank you um you know i think in this world everyone's dealt i always say look, everyone's dealt a different hand mm -hmm. and there's no question that at least on a surface level some people are dealt hands which are much more advantageous than others this is on a local level a national level a, a global level a historical level as right. well i do ultimately think that certainly if you're an adult once you reach adulthood it's it's up to you how you play those cards right right and so i mean i admire anyone who has a strong mindset and is working to build success for themselves their families their communities etc but i do have extra respect for it actually when it's you know a situation where yeah you, you could argue that, okay this person was dealt dealt a difficult hand they've had adversity everyone has their own adversity in, in different ways but mm -hmm. i think objectively i think it's fair to say yeah some people like just okay that's you know you hear their story and you're like oh man like that's there's the one thing after the other and there's this and there's that and then someone else doesn't doesn't have all of that but what's interesting is the mindset and the mentality of it because you do get people who are dealt if you want to use the term privilege which is a weird term these days you know a very advantageous very privileged hand but they still have that victimhood mentality which you alluded right. to earlier you know they've got all these things going for them they've you know they're they're in the top 0.1 percent of all of these different measures and they've still got that mentality of woe is me the world is against me everything's unfair like everyone else right. is privileged and i'm oppressed whatever and then you have people who are like man okay this person genuinely especially some people you know born in developing countries and they're literally born into like abject poverty and they've had to deal with this and deal with war or maybe they're refugees or something like that mm -hmm. and their mentality is still just like the opposite right like they've been through this and they've been through that and they've been through that but they're still just positive and they know they can achieve and they're looking for opportunities and they're taking advantage of them for me those are the people i'm just like man okay props right like <laughs> Because yeah. that's those are the people who sort of most inspire me. So, what are some of the the story you told? I feel is it's the story. It's similar to the story of millions and millions of people out there. You know, in a, in various countries. I myself am from the UK, but I know that the story you told, even statistically, let alone anecdotally, it's a fairly common story amongst mm -hmm. a lot of Black Americans, primarily being raised by their moms, fathers either totally out of the picture or there, but not really very present, etc. So what are your thoughts on that sort of wider story within, I guess, what you could call the black American community or even just the Western world in general? I think regardless of I think with, with black Americans, obviously, the statistically the rates of absent fathers or single mothers are higher. But if you look at the overall trend across mm -hmm. everyone, you know, compared to where it was, say, even 30 or 40 years ago, it's a concerning trend in terms right. of what is what's happening there. So what are your thoughts around that? And where do you think things are going? You know, hopefully. Hopefully, I, I hope things start to reverse. But uh, as I look at it, it doesn't seem to be getting that much better. A lot of people say that for Black Americans, we're the canary in the coal mine for many yes. situations. So when it comes to uh, you know white Americans, if they look at Black Americans, uh, the statistic is about 25% of white Americans grow up with uh, in a single parent home. Uh, Black Americans are in this uh, 70 around the 70 range. Hispanics are, I believe, like in the 40 high 40s. So if they want to look at an example of what could happen if the father is completely removed from the situation, if it keeps trending in that direction, take a look at our community. A lot of the issues that stem from the single parent home has a lot to do with economics, has a lot to do with crime and, and poverty. You know, I think it goes hand in hand. I, I think the idea that Black Americans are poor because of racism, I think is missing the bigger picture. Black Americans have been poor, uh, you know, for different, uh, different ages, different time periods. But the difference is the criminality, uh, the presence of drugs, the presence of large amounts of crime, the incarceration rates. This is all relatively new in American, uh, Black American history. You know, even in a period where, like the, the Jim Crow South, where legal oppression existed, our criminal rates were not nearly as high. Our incarceration rates were not really as high. They were about proportionate, If you, especially if you look at like the 1930s. This idea that uh, oppression is the cause for us being incarcerated, if that's the case, we had legalized oppression and we weren't incarcerated nearly as high. We were more likely to be together as a, as a family unit, even at times over white Americans. People say, well, there's reasons why that had to be the case, or Americans in general were more conservative as far as how they saw the family unit. And all those things come into account. But the, the point I'm making is that if in a time where 
were you could uh, you could oppress us a lot easier yet we were still proportionately free mm -hmm. then why is it that we have all these laws changed there is no legal upstanding there there is no more jim crow we have way more advocacy way more leeway way more freedom yet we are incarcerated at a higher rate so you know i i talk about these things because logically that doesn't make a lot of sense and and to be honest with you i think black americans even from if you want to say you know the people who who are uh, racist who they find this actually more useful not locked up to be honest with you mm. I, I don't think it does anybody anything beneficial if we are incarcerated i think politically we're used as a scapegoat consistently and that only helps other people not our ourselves and it helps other people if we're free rather than locked up if we're locked up we're just a drain on the system mm -hmm. but if we're if we're free then uh you know we can continue to be uh, political pawns or social pawns whatever situation you want to look at i'm kind of veering off a little bit but this, That's okay. this, the single parent home it affects economics uh it, it affects childhood development it, it affects education the passage of wealth so a lot of times people talk about pre-civil rights or actually it was a pre-1960s you know fha loan and people could only buy houses, but they excluded black Americans. All these things are true. No, I, I will never deny that. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that we never talk about when it comes to wealth is wealth of knowledge. How do you obtain wealth? How do you hold it? And we can look at lottery winners, people who yes. are poor, receive a ton of money, and then they lose it in a matter of a few years. Mm -hmm. They don't know how to earn wealth. They don't know how to uh, obtain wealth. They don't know how to hold wealth. And wealth of knowledge is, is extremely important. I could give my son a house, but if he doesn't know how to maintain it, he doesn't know what to do with it, what's the point of him having the house yeah. it's going to be valueless in a period of time so yeah i could give my son a house that i got from an fha loan but if he doesn't have the money to keep up with it if he doesn't know how to to maintain it to hold on to it then it's not that you know valuable so i think we always skip over wealth of knowledge when mm -hmm. we talk about when we talk about systemic racism or, or anything of that nature i think that that's a crucial piece and historically men were the ones who were working more more so than women so which means that the men knew how to earn uh, a substantial wealth how to hold the substantial wealth and knew the information to pass it down to their children mm -hmm. to repeat the cycle over and over so it, it's not necessarily that um, you know if we're talking about extreme wealth it's harder to lose extreme wealth but at the same time if you're if your father's a billionaire he's likely telling you the steps that he took to become a billionaire and yes. you're going to repeat it so we're talking about people who are middle class and they stay middle class generation after generation why because they're repeating the behavior of their fathers and mothers to stay within that class so yeah i, I yeah. think when you miss out the father you miss out you miss out on certain pieces of knowledge and it causes uh you know like a scatter effect you know yes. you don't know how to move throughout the world another another simple thing no i'm 100 percent with you on all that another simple thing is simply that two is more than one right right so as you've said you know if someone is a you know single mothers are more common than single fathers you know if you have a single mother situation mm -hmm. of course you have the actual absence of a man and the entire male and masculine role there mm -hmm. but also it now means that one person is now doing the job of what should be a two-person job and you Absolutely. cannot physically be at home and at work at the same time so there's always going to be there's always going to be sacrifices and in fact you may now need to, that person may now need to work even two jobs which is taking even more time and then they're spending more time away from it's just basic it's just basic logic it's 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 rational it's math i think a big problem with a lot of these issues and this i think this is something that um, i'm going to say this as an as a non-black american as an outsider as someone who cares about everybody but who you know in, in a sort of specific way i do i do feel some you know maybe just also being a black person and being a person in general you know i do i am interested and i do very much sort of root for black americans in a way and i think a lot of people don't understand that because i don't promote a certain narrative right i am very much on the hey get out of the victimhood narrative get into this victor mentality for a lot of reasons but i think that do you, do you know with one of the big things i think that's just a huge problem you touched on this earlier is just emotionality mm -hmm. and emotional manipulation right because if people are extremely emotionally sensitive they are easy to manipulate they can be manipulated by politicians they can be manipulated by the media they can be manipulated by any person who may not have the best of intentions you know maybe they just hey we just want those black we just want those black votes or we just 
want this, we just want that. And so they peddle certain narratives. And then the people who speak out against it, whether it's white, if white people speak out against certain things, you know, you know, people say, oh, those white Americans there, hey, they're just they're just racist. They're just trying to uphold white supremacy. If mm-hmm. a black person, you know, whether they're American or not, they'll start calling them all these, you know, you know, the typical racial epithets and calling them Uncle Tom's and all of this and that. And I'm just like, gosh, like here is the issue, because if you cannot discuss a problem openly and honestly, you can't solve it. And right. yeah, sure. People can. I think people like these concepts of systemic and structural and institutional racism and white supremacy. Like, people like all of this because there's no personal accountability now. Right. Mm-hmm. You just blame everything on the system, whatever that means. Most people, I think most when most people say the system, they don't even know what they're talking about. They just say the system. Oh, the system is racist. The system is this. The system is that. And it's like, look, man, you have to give people agency. Like people have agency. People have individual responsibility, accountability. If you make certain decisions and then you just go and blame the system, I'm just like, come on, man. Like that can't be a, a persistent scapegoat. And I do feel like it does certainly seem like as an outsider who's mm-hmm. you know not emotionally attached in or invested in this thing i'm just like man i wish you know and i, I don't even like i, I was gonna say like, i wish black americans but it's like it's, i know this isn't even like all black americans but there is a significant percent who just they're so easy to they're so easily emotionally manipulated and i just see it happening you just see yeah. politicians just like you know waving carrots and pulling strings and it's just like okay people just go this way and i'm just like you know there's there's this herd mentality and then like i said when people go against it they get attacked so viciously even mm-hmm. though they have good intent and they're just trying to be like, hey, like, what about this? What about this perspective? How, oh, why, hey, why don't we, instead of relying on that, why don't we build this thing? Or why don't we do this? Or why don't we do that? Or hey, like, okay, look at the family situation. Let's look at some of this, the crime situations. What's going on here? Let's turn the focus inwards and let's see what we can do. Because the truth is, we're in 2021 now. We, we Racism is virtually at an all-time low. But the mm-hmm. thing is, a question I often ask when people peddle these narratives, I say, okay, if you could remove, if you could snap your fingers and you could totally erase all all racism from everybody's heart and mind in the United States of America, all traces of racism, like every every black person, white person, police officer, Asian person, every politician, every person. In the, if you could just erase racism, right? Mm-hmm. Would the problem, would, would some of these problems persist? And if the answer is a strong yes, then I'm like, okay, well, then racism is not the core, is not the core problem here, right? It, that, that's not the core problem. And I can understand that based on, you know, genuine systemic racism that existed in the past, that can create certain situations, which now have an effect in the present day time. Totally aware. I understand that. But the past is immutable, right? right. The, 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 you, you cannot change the past. So yes, slavery did exist. Jim Crow existed. Segregation existed, right? They're, they're all, all of these things. Redlining existed, right? There are certain things. It's like, yes, these are just, these are just facts. And you can do this, by the way, with like any, any population, like in any country, any population, you can go back in history and say, okay, these are certain things that happened. You know, an obvious example would be to look, look at uh, Jewish people, right? One third of Jewish people Mm -hmm. in the entire world got systematically annihilated less than a hundred years ago, right? Mm -hmm. And like, that's, that's very, very severe. That's documented. That's clear. But sure, Jewish people recognize the Holocaust and everybody does and understands the effects of that. But I don't generally see Jewish people using that as like a like a permanent sort of crutch or, or as a reason to not be successful now or to not embrace their family units now or to behave in certain ways or to engage in criminality, etc. So it's one of those things where it's like, I understand the impact and I can understand why people do it. But I think, number one, I think it's a little bit dishonest in some cases. And then also it's just, it's not helpful because you're skirting around a lot of the real issues shoes. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, we'll talk about maybe there's 10 things on the table and you're allowed to talk about three of them, right? Right. And then the other seven are there. And those seven are probably more are more impactful than those three. But as soon as you talk about those people start getting jacked up on their emotions, people will start yelling at you, calling you names, screaming. And and most people understandably don't want to deal with that. But that means that the the problems just the problems just persist. I mean, the the same thing happens here in the UK. It's not it's not unique to the US. The same thing happens here. There will be certain issues and it's like everyone wants to skirt around it. They don't really want to talk about the core things. I'd say a great similar thing would be um, not a great thing, but a, a similar comparison when people talk about like knife crime or gun crime. Mm-hmm. Right. And people start immediately talking about the type of gun 
or the type of knife or how many bullets should be allowed in the magazine or this. And I'm like, <laughs> and I'm just like, you're missing, you're missing the core of the problem, right? Like people aren't dying because a gun can, AR-15 can hold a certain amount of bullets. Like that's not why people are getting shot. Like you're, you're distracting from the real issue. The, pro- the issue is why, why are there people primarily young men being produced in society that want to hurt people in such a way that want to kill people we all have access to deadly weapons we've all got knives in our kitchens plenty of americans have guns we've got cars we have like we all have access to stuff that can kill people but these tools don't get up on their own and go and do it so the question is okay what is going on in our society what do we need to look at as as a culture as a people individual level like what is going on with us ethically morally in terms of the way people are supporting each other, all that kind of stuff, what is happening? What what leads a young man down the road where they decide, you know what, I want to go out today and I want to just like kill some innocent people, right? Like by the time you got there, a whole bunch of stuff has already happened, which Mm -hmm. has led to that point. And it seems like people don't want to have an open and honest conversation about all of those other factors. Um, A big one actually being family as well. Um, Mm -hmm. People don't want to discuss that. People don't want to talk about the impact of all of that. And I don't know, this is where I, I sometimes say political correctness kills people. And that's what I mean when I say it, right? Because it prevents mm-hmm. people from having open, honest, fair conversations about these things, bringing the different ideas to the table and just laying it out openly without accusing people of not caring or wanting people to die or being this or being that. It's like, as yeah. soon as it descends into that, it, you know, it's, it just becomes a mess. No, I, you said a lot there. I, uh, I, I completely agree with you. I think um, to kind of go back a little bit, you know, victims need saviors. Mm. And, you know, there is a um, kind of like a sick codependency between the two. So the victim needs someone to save them. The victim needs someone to save them and the saviors need uh, someone to save. You know, it makes them feel better. And when I see, for example, critical race theory being implemented in, in school districts, nobody was asking for this. No. You know, this is, this is coming from elitists, who think that they need to save other people and we're going to forcibly use, uh, you know, our power to do so, especially through a government public school system uh, to force you to understand certain things that we want you to think, um, regardless if it's taboo or not. And, you know, even someone who is a proponent of CRT has to kind of understand it's somewhat taboo, Mm -hmm. even if you think it's right it's taboo to even discuss it in the manner that it's being discussed. Um, And I take issue to people not even being critical of that. Um, You know, the big word part of critical race theory that people miss is theory. Uh You know, they call it a theory for a reason. Yes. Uh, When you start to unpack it, when you start to disprove it, just like anything else, when you try to use reason, logic, all these different things, It breaks apart, which is why it's extremely difficult for someone who is a proponent of CRT to have a legitimate discussion about it and be critical of it, um, and they stem away from it. So that's just one particular area. But there is a general savior complex that's happening. Um, And in the book, I I call it, you know, the liberal savior complex. Um, This idea that their advocacy is for my own good Mm -hmm. and removing my personal agency. Um, You know, I I gave kind of like a a personal story where, um, you know, I started traveling uh, around, you know, traveling a little bit, especially throughout Europe. And I made a a friend who's from the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And he had found out that some of the things that Trump was doing, I agreed with. And our relationship turned from there. And I told him, you know, we don't have to talk about politics. We can just talk as friends. That's perfectly fine. But every time he couldn't, he could not not talk about politics. You know, he had to, <laughs> he had to keep going there. And so, you know, I would be like, I thought you didn't want to speak about it. Yeah. So one, one of the things he said to me is, I can't believe you can't see how America is racist. And I'm thinking to myself that the ego of this person, you don't live here. <laughs> You know, yeah. you don't live here. You're not black, mm. you know, and and even like for myself, I've lived in five states. Yeah. So I've been around white people and I know generally what it's like to live in America. You don't. You visited America. You haven't lived here. So you don't know what it's like. You don't even have a perspective. At least if you lived here, maybe you have some sort of perspective. 
but you're more out of bounds by even saying that and dict dictating that to me, uh, towards me. If I was to say that about the Netherlands, you were like, well, how dare you say that? You don't yeah. live here. <laughs> you know, exactly. That's the point. Um, you know, it doesn't mean that my perspective is the right perspective. It's just my perspective. Mm -hmm. But, you know, have some grounds to make a perspective. You don't live here. You don't understand. You don't understand certain dynamics. So um, our obviously our, our uh, relationship dwindled away. But one of the last things he sent me, the last message that he sent me was, um, this is my last attempt to save you. Oh, wow. And I was just like, you know, screw you. And I, I just bl blocked him from there. But it, it's a it's a very savior complex. Mm -hmm. It's not allowing me to think for myself. Yeah. Um, and it, it's it's very racist and bigoted in its own way. That's the right. thing. And I don't I don't get how people who are like that don't see it. Like right. It, it's right. I, I don't get how someone could not see um, how just out of pocket that is. It's very audacious. Right. It's, right. it's very audacious to, um, you know, I'm a white guy from the Netherlands, but let me, <laughs> you know, like let, it, it, it's I don't know. I, I find it very odd. Like I've experienced this many, many times and I'm just I, I, I don't get the lack of self-awareness just to and, and, and humility just to be like, oh, OK, that's interesting. What what do you OK, what 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 do you like about Trump's policies? I'm intrigued, right? Like just it's yeah. a sim it's a simple question instead of just going, "Oh, well, you you must be some kind of uh, I don't know, traitor to your race or you must be some sort of I've I've had people call me a black white supremacist. I'm like, "Bro, what <laughs> When you start yeah. calling black people white supremacists, you should probably like sit down and and have a think, okay, maybe maybe I'm just wrong here. Maybe like I'm missing something. Um when you start calling Jewish people Nazis, black people white supremacists, like yeah, you 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 might be off base, but people like this they tend to they're so sure they're right. They're so certain that they are right, and that that one perspective is the perspective. And yeah, it's like the ego uh, must be protected. They can't just go, oh, okay, actually, yeah. maybe I need to rethink. Cool, like that's a different perspective. Let me. Okay, there's people who think like that. That's interesting. And that one perspective, if there's one person who thinks like that, okay, there's probably millions of people. Who, who think like that. Um, yeah. Yeah. There was a, actually, there was another friend who, um, funny enough, I, I noticed that she became, so I use the word extremist. An extremist is someone who can't recognize that they're wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, they can't take scrutiny. Um, I'm not an extremist. I'll admit when I'm wrong all the time. And a matter of fact, I switched my political ideology multiple times. Yeah. Um, and I, I kind of detail that in the book, but I had a friend who who basically became like an extremist, and one our, our it was our last phone conversation where she said, um, "I'm going to listen to black voices," and my and my other friend who is black says X, Y, and Z, and I'm like, "You know I'm black, right? Mm -hmm. Like, are you going to listen to my voice? Why yeah. is my voice not relevant mm -hmm. in this discussion?" And, and she couldn't understand that. You know, you can disagree with me, and that's fine. Yeah. But this idea that there's a monolith, a monolithic black voice mm -hmm. is offensive to me. Yes. Um, you know, even when I was more liberal minded, I understood that there were still some things that I differed from other black Americans, of and course. that's perfectly fine. Yeah. But but it, there is this there is this preaching of monolithic behavior for black Americans, and also, um, and I kind of talk about in the book, black leadership. We're the only racial demographic in America that is expected to have racial leaders. Yes. And I, yes. I understand where it kind of comes from. You know, it comes from the civil rights era, um, especially if you want to highlight Martin Luther King, who I admire. Mm -hmm. However, he had an objective, and that objective was completed. And unfortunately, he was killed not long afterwards. But he was doing it for the advocacy of black Americans, but all Americans. Yes. You know, he wanted to unite Americans. He wanted people to understand each other. Um, you know, one of the one of the phrases that they used during that time period was I am a man, not I am a black man mm -hmm. and you're a white man. No, I am a man, meaning that we're we're equal. We have similar interests despite us looking different. The problem is that when you get the government, when you get one of the largest entities in the world to change its stance and 
start moving in your direction, that's actually creating power and you're creating an industry, which is, it, it, there's no wonder why Jesse Jackson, for example, who was one of the right-hand men for Martin Luther King uh, is running around being a, you know, a race baiter ultimately. Um, you know, it stems from the civil rights era and it just kept going. Um, you know, I had a friend told me that basically once you create an industry, it's extremely difficult to get rid of it. Yep, and yep. when you create a, a race-based um, grievance industry, even if the grievance is legitimate, mm -hmm. once you have it, it's extremely hard to get rid of it. Once people start making money off of it. Yeah, um, they don't want to get rid of it. They don't want to get rid they of it. They don't want to get rid of it, man. Racism is a multi-billion, the illusion of racism, let me put it more simply, um, right. is a multi-billion dollar industry, right? right? You have to maintain it. It's like you have these um, feminist writers who need so-called male supremacy and the patriarchy to exist, or they have nothing to rail against. If you've made your whole career talking about race and racism in mm. the UK or the USA, like we, we have our race baiters here in the UK too, um, which has a very different history as well. So some of the arguments you can make for the US don't even apply to the UK <laughs> and people, people still do the same thing, right? People still play the same games. And I'm just like, man, you can't even use those narratives, right? Even when they're having the, you know, like, Black Lives Matter marches in the UK. I mean, I think the police killed zero unarmed black people last year. Right? It's like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, what are you guys doing? You yeah. know, like this is not even relevant here. The police here don't even carry guns for the most part. So it's just not it's just not relevant. But people like that whole narrative and they want to it to me. It's the analogy I use is, you know, when you get a cut and then like, you know, it heals over and you get a scab mm -hmm. and like instead of just letting it heal there are a minority of people who are just picking at it every day on the TV, in movies, on the radio, and they're like they just have to pick at it on social media, keep picking at it, picking at it, and creating problems where they don't exist. And in, right. in some cases, one thing I find really fascinating is what I call label inflation. So the way that they dilute certain terms so that they now mean something, the, the bar becomes a lot lower, okay? Mm -hmm. So white supremacy, does have a proper definition, right? White supremacy is an ideology, a belief system where someone believes that white people are genetically inherently superior, right? White people should rule because they are inherently superior. That's what that's what white supremacy means. You're talking KKK, you're talking uh, Nazi ideology, which was even not, you know, it wasn't even for all white people. Right? You're talking like, these are actual, those, that's actual white supremacy. Whereas now, it, 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 people have diluted it. So all of a sudden in 2021, people are talking about white supremacy more than they were in 2011, right? Mm -hmm. Because they've, they've, they've watered down the definition. So it just means, oh, hey, there's three white people on TV. That's white supremacy. And I'm like, bro, what are you, what are you talking about? Like, that's not what white supremacy means. And then they'll redefine <laughs> racism and they'll redefine this and that so that it ends up being, you know, racist now basically means anybody I disagree with. I mean, it's, it's mm -hmm. pretty much at that point now where they're just calling everybody, everybody's being called racist. And it's just like, um, and, and I also think that's destructive. I think each time that happens, I think the genuine white supremacists and the genuine racists are quite pleased with all this because <laughs> it means, it means they can just hide because, um, it's been watered down so much that now if you actually do get someone, like if you actually did get a legitimate white supremacist movement in the UK or the USA, it's like, well, what do you, what do you call that now? Like we, you've you've already used the racist and Nazi and white supremacist like to describe uh, Trump supporters and Brexit voters and general Republicans and conservatives. So it's like, wh what do you call them now? Are they like super Nazis? Are they like mm -hmm. ultra? You know what I mean? Are they like ultra ultra? You've you've already called everyone else far right. So are they like yeah. ultra mega far right? Um, <laughs> and and I think long term that's a lot of a big problem. Not only is it not nice to call these people names, call people names when they don't actually advocate for these things nor believe in them like that's out of order but then also the words lose their power and their meaning so people can hide and then you can't actually define a genuine threat like it's it's legitimately come to the time now where i mean i remember when if i go back even 15 years ago if i heard um a charge or an accusation of racism i took it pretty seriously yeah. right like if i heard if someone said oh that person is racist i was like ooh like okay like what's up here you know like really now when i hear that someone is racist i'm just like okay do you do you mean they actually are or do you mean like the 2021 definition do you just mean oh 
they, they, they you disagree with them on X policy. You know, right. they think immigration should, should come down. And so now you're calling them racist. Oh, they voted for Trump. So you're calling them racist. Like, you know, that's a totally different thing. And I, I think when the l words get, you know, bastardized and watered down so much, it becomes harder to it becomes harder to understand the world and to define things properly because racism is a big charge. Right. To call somebody a racist is, you know, that that's a that's a major charge. Right. Just right. like, right. you know. Just like you don't, you don't go around calling people murderers and you know, and rapists and what. Like if they haven't actually murdered, so imagine if, imagine if someone was just like a bit aggressive, or like got into fights a lot, and so you start calling them a murderer. It's like no, like have they killed somebody? It's like no, but you know they're 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 violent. And I'm like yeah, but you have to use those words properly. Otherwise, what do you what word would then you then use if everyone who's aggressive now is being called a murderer? What do you call people who actually murder people? Right. Um, right. if everyone's a racist just because you don't like their tone or their politics, then what do you call people who actually believe, you know, some people are inherently superior or that a certain race of people should be, you know, subjugated or whatever, you know, you don't have these words anymore. Uh, so I think that's yeah. very dangerous. Yeah. It's very similar to when, when people say they just throw out systemic racism. Yes. Um, and I don't like using that term because it becomes this blanket term. So if they see in it some sort of inequity, they just say, well, it's because systemic racism. Mm -hmm. But when you break it down, like there's a variety of reasons why there are certain inequities created. So, you know, we always go back to, to the prison uh, situation, um, which is always funny to me that anytime we talk about black Americans, we automatically go to prisons, but um, I'm, glad I'm not the only one who noticed that. Cause I don't, I don't, I don't like that either, man. I don't yeah. like that either. Um, you know, and that's my demographic. My demographic is basically black males mm -hmm. uh, who, you know, so when we look at that situation, are we making the claim that black men are disproportionately locked up into in prison because uh, you know, the system wants them locked up. Um, all right. So are you making the claim that these black men who are locked up in prison are innocent? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, so is your complaint that the government is too efficient when it comes to locking up criminals? If you're saying that they're not innocent, or then if the, you know, so what exactly is the argument? So is the argument, okay, well, they're targeting them too much, even though they are criminals. Mm -hmm. One, why are we advocating for criminals? So that's that's another thing. Um, I don't care what you look like. If you commit a crime and you get caught, you get caught. But that's a different story. But, um, you know, black Americans, uh, the statistic is about it's somewhere between 60 and 65 percent of black Americans live in 10 states. We okay. live in in very uh, concentrated areas. and We live in urban city centers uh, for the majority. Mm -hmm. So that means that we are dealing with city police. There's more police presence. There's more people that live there. So we are have a higher likeliness of having an encounter with black uh, with the uh, police officers just in general. Mm -hmm. If black Americans were scattered out throughout the country, it would be a, a vastly different situation. But we're not. We're in highly concentrated areas where there's more police presence. There's more financial support for policing um, mm -hmm. because there's such a greater amount of people outside of black Americans. Yes. So to me, that makes sense as to why we're the ones getting caught and not some mm -hmm. kid who's living in the suburbs where there's 15 cops that patrol the area, you know, 24 hours of the day, yeah. you know, they're less likely to get caught. Um, and urban than, and urban centers all over the world, urban centers have more crime, have more right. gang activity, right. have more, have more drug, drug dealing and all that, all that sort of stuff that just comes from a big city. Right. Um, simple as that. It doesn't matter if it's London or Paris or Los Angeles or New York City. Um, that's just a big city thing. Right. And and so, you know, the the claim of systemic racism, because what they end up doing is saying um, everything is part of some system. Yes. So they say, uh, you know, they don't hire black Americans, you know, at the same rate. And they, they use the, uh, you know, the there's like a couple studies where they talked about their name being different, but the res resume being the same. See, that's systemic racism, but that's not a system. That's not how private industry works. You know, uh, Kellogg's doesn't collude with general motors. You know, it, that's not, that's not how it works. There could be a social attitude, but that's mm -hmm. not a system. 
you're you're diluting the term system. The only true system that there is is government. Now, Jim Crow was systemic racism. Absolutely. That is that is absolutely the case. Yes. And that is why I rail against and why I'm more so these days libertarian, because the more I look at the government and how they my, my, my man, my man. <laughs> <laughs> right. The, you, yeah. you know, the more that the more that I look at the government, the more that mm-hmm. they do and they claim to help people, the more they harm them. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we can even go to local government. You know, I'm more of a local government person or at least a uh, state's rights person. But, you know, we can look at these different cities and let, let's say Chicago. Chicago is considered the most segregated city in the country. Right. They haven't had a Republican, uh, a Republican um, mayor since was the 1800s. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, so if your complaint is that the government, uh, it, there's so much segregation, how come the Democrats who are supposed to be your saviors mm-hmm. haven't done anything about it? That is mm-hmm. their city, literally. Um, you know, but even more so, that is the government allowing for these particular practices to, to stay in play. Yes. Um, you know, I also challenge the idea that the only way for black Americans to succeed is if we have more of a presence within government. Mm-hmm. That's utterly false. You can look at Baltimore, for example. Uh, the police chief is a black. The mayor is mm-hmm. black. The mm-hmm. DA is black. Um, the police force is more than fifty percent black. The city council is majority black. Mm-hmm. Everybody who is in power is black. Yet mm-hmm. they have some of the worst reading rates. They have some of the worst crime in the country. Extremely high murder rates. Poverty is extremely high. So this idea that black representation is the end all be all, especially within government, is not true. Yeah. You know, and then what ends up happening is government attracts certain people and certain types of people. It attracts people who seek power, it attracts mm-hmm. people who want clout, all these different things, um, and, and people who are generally corrupt. And when you have the arm of the government to do what you want, and you know, you're the one who's essentially making the rules and you're allowed to kind of get around it in some ways, because you know people who are within the government who are supposed to enforce the rules. You know, the king can get away with stuff because he's the king, Yes. you know? So it's it's the same kind of idea. It's the same reason why, uh, you know, you have all these corrupt politicians who go around the country doing essentially whatever they want, um, and they rarely get caught. And we Mm -hmm. know that there's corruption. We know that there's projects that are supposed to be taken off, but somehow they run out of money, you know? And very rarely do they get caught. Mm-hmm. And when they do get caught, we, we don't really talk about it. Uh, you know, New Jersey is one of the most uh, corrupt governments in, in the country, the state governments. Um, they get corruption charges all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they get, but the point I'm trying to make essentially is that this idea that the government is our savior in every which way possible, no. when in reality, it's been our oppressor. Yes, man. I, dude, I make this point all the time when people especially when i talk to people who you know like to use these terms you know systemic and institutional racism etc i'm like okay give me not just in the usa on on even a global level give give me Mm -hmm. give me the the biggest and most egregious examples of institutionalized racism okay they'll be Mm -hmm. like okay talk usa they'll be like slavery i'm like agreed um jim crow laws agreed um you know general segregation agreed um the kkk and it being backed and including politicians agreed um redlining agreed i'm like okay who did all those <laughs> <laughs> who okay. did who did all of those they're like the government okay and you're the one asking why i'm libertarian <laughs> right? it's like, right it's like my friend uh do you know eric july yeah 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 yeah, yeah. He had a great quote that uh, that he said. I'm, I'm going to repeat it. I'm going to give him props on this. He said, "Without the teeth of the state, racism is simply a bad idea." Right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. With when, when it's not institutionalized and doesn't have that governmental power and backing, yeah, racism is bad. Individual racism, whatever. Right. That's a negative attitude that we want to get out of society, but it it stays at a level. Right. You can't have the freaking Holocaust. You cannot have chattel slavery without the government 
backing, right? Like a government has to back that. If you look at genocides, the Rwandan genocide in our lifetime, right? Like let's go to Africa, right? Black on black, right? Mm -hmm. Millions of people killing each other. The government, right? Look at South Africa, apartheid, the government, right? Like it's so, this is the thing that I don't, I don't know why this doesn't click for more people <laughs> where it's like you look at all of these examples, both nationally and internationally. And it's like, you know, the government had to do that. Jim Crow laws had to be enforced by the government to keep, to force segregation, right? Like black and white Americans would have happily, even just because of the power of capitalism, right? Like people want to make money. If you own a restaurant telling, you know, a significant chunk of the population that they can't, that they can't, they can't come in or you're running a bus company or running trains. What Like that's not good for your bottom line. Even if you did have some racism in your brain or in your heart, you still know, like, that's not good for my bottom line. So the government actually had to enforce that to stop it from happening, right? They had to put in anti-miscegenation laws to stop black people and white people from marrying, et cetera, because they want, right? Like, these people want to, and they're still going to go and do it secretly anyway. But it's like the government is trying to stop the the natural integration from actually happening. And it's right. like when, when they do it, people act as if, oh, the government, the government granted the, the government granted this right. And I'm like, no, it's a bit like what people have been doing over this past year and a half, right? Where people are acting like, oh, the government gave us back this. Right. I'm like, bro, bro, you always had that right. You, you've always had a right to go outside and to show your face in public, right? The fact that they're infringed on it and now they're saying, oh, you can do it again. I'm like, don't give them, don't congratulate them. Like, don't, right. don't congratulate them because they're saying, hey, you can go outside without a mask. It's like, yeah, thanks. Like, <laughs> I, did, I didn't need your, I didn't need your permission for that. So I yeah. think um, a lot of people miss that mentality. Yeah, just a few quick points. So the first thing uh, you just said it right there, the government doesn't grant you rights. It only chooses not to restrict it. Mm -hmm. So that those are two com completely different things there. If we were to go back to slavery, um, you know, this idea that this is why I don't like talking about racism, because it's such a simplistic way of going about things. And on top of that, the people who talk about racism also at the same time say that race is a social construct. So yes. why are you adhering to it? <laughs> um, you know, that's infuriating. Yeah. But let's go back to slavery. Are we to consider that in the South um, that all white Americans had slaves? No, we know that's utterly false. Mm -hmm. Who are the only people who can have slaves? The wealthy. Yes. You know, the people who can afford to take care of other people, at least keep them somewhat fed to work, to at least economically be able to spend money and buy slaves. This takes the wealthy elite to even do so. Mm -hmm. So this is why I always go back to reparations. Why? Why do all Americans have to pay for the for the wealthy elite of the past and their doing? Um, and then, you know, that that's a that's a huge thing in my head. As far as we don't focus on what's really important, the the importance is that yeah, there's power, yeah, there's power and balance, but who is in power? And as soon as you go to race, then you're missing the point. Yes, yes. The power and balance has more to do with what's up here. What are your intentions? What are your economic means? Which is why class mat matters more than race. Mm -hmm. um, I know in the UK, and um, you know, class is a big thing here as well but we just don't necessarily reference that which yeah. is why it's completely asinine when we say black americans and immediately go to poor there are wealthy black um, americans it, it's it's also that black americans are some of the richest people on the planet the, obviously the right. wealthiest obviously the wealthiest black people on the planet but also mm -hmm. just the wealthiest period i think that's also a problem with um you know obviously this is the thing with with a lot of people in the us because most people in the most americans never leave the usa and so they over time develop a perspective that is so American biased that right. it can be very sort of naive or ignorant towards the rest of the world. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so I can understand, OK, within the USA, which is a wealthy country, obviously you're going to have relative um, poverty and wealth. But if you look on a global level, I'm just like, wait, what do you? <laughs> what's 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 going on here have you have you guys heard of um you know th there's a it, it's similar even i i think i posted this the other day when people were you know sometimes when people use the term black conservative both in the uk and usa people talk as if black conservatives are these uni unicorns like very very rare and i'm like are you aware that like most of the continents of africa which has like 
almost a billion black people. <laughs> like, <laughs> certainly by any Western liberal standard, most of them would be pre- concerned, be pretty conservative, especially socially conservative. Like, there are mm-hmm. ideas here that even conservatives in the UK and USA support. If you go to Nigeria and you float some of those ideas, like they're going to laugh you out the room. They're going to be like, you people, are cra- <laughs> right? they're gonna, you people are crazy. What are you guys talking about? Heck no. Um, right. You know, and so, yeah, it, it's, it's really it's really interesting. And I think perspective is also important because it helps provide gratitude. And I think right. that gratitude helps to promote the victor mentality. Once actually you're grateful for where you are and what you have and the opportunities. And look, even if things are not things are not perfect yet, you know, things are not there. It's like, dude, you've still, you've got opportunities. You have potential. You could be born into, okay, this situation is not, is not ideal, but you know what? You were born, I mean, simply being born in, you know, we're both in our thirties, right? Mm -hmm. You're born, both, both born in the eighties. Okay. Simply being born in the 1980s instead of the 1880s, (laughs) (laughs) right? Or, or even the 1930s, like, huge advantage simply mm-hmm. being born in the uk simply being born in the usa right huge advantage right like there are people who literally there, there's there the majority of people in the world like at least half the people in the world like you're just born into a country where the opportunity is so limited right in the states you could start out you know sort of at the the bottom quintile of the of the hierarchy you know bottom 10 percent and you can still you can you can rise like there are opportunities. I'm not saying everything is easy, but there are opportunities. There are plenty of places in the world where even if you're smart, even if you're hard working, like unless you can get like, why is immigration to the West a thing? Right. Because people are like, oh, my gosh, look at the opportunities these people have over there. Like, I'm going to just I'm going to leave everything I have and I'm going to go and I'm going to move to the UK or I'm going to move to New York and I'm just going to start something. Right. Whether they're coming exactly. from uh, parts of Asia or parts of Africa or South America, whatever it is. But I think a lot of people who are born into those circumstances, they don't even it's like you're actually so people are so privileged that they don't even see that. And, and they don't even see, you know, they're, they're the ones calling everyone else privileged. And I'm like, dude, like you don't even understand. You're talking about the one percent. You're in the one percent. <laughs> <laughs> you, you are the one percent on a global right. level. You are the one percent. And you're the one who's going around like, you know, promoting all this. Oh, I'm oppressed. I'm victimized, whatever. And I'm just like, stop, man. Like. You yeah, know, see, we're we're the uh, we're the, we're like the uh, Beverly Hill kids who complain <laughs> about everything. Yeah. It's like sh- shut up. You have yeah. everything that you want, and yeah. you have the opportunities ahead of you. So you know, sitting in your in your luxurious home with your air conditioning unit and central air, and, you know, just saying like, oh, it's so oppressive over here. I just can't. <laughs> like, we sound extremely spoiled, and yeah. like you said, it's it's that perspective when you. Like I'll use an example. I have a I have a new friend. Uh, since I wrote the book, I've been in contact with some great people. She is from uh, she's Somali, but she came from a, a Kenyan refugee camp. Okay. And uh, you know she details, and she's actually starting to write a book. So we'll give her a little shout out. But um, her name is Sahara. But she she experienced some of the worst things that you could possibly experience in the refugee camp. Mm. And she had the opportunity to come to the United States. She is the most grateful person I ever talked to. Uh, every time she sends me a message, she's like, today is a great day. I'm having a wonderful day. Yeah. You know, this is a girl who grew up in a world where she was told she's not allowed to read, mm-hmm. that she has to adhere by certain rules. Mm-hmm. Um, if she questioned it, she, she was beaten mm-hmm. by family members. And now she is literate. You know, she, she speaks English. Um, she's gone to school. She's a, she's been able to live her life in a particular way and had opportunities that weren't there for her in Kenya. So it's this level of appreciation that she'll never forget. She'll always remember those days where it felt like the world was stuck around her, where she had to walk for miles to get water. Yeah. Um, and here we are, we complain, and we have all, all the luxuries in the world that even Americans from 100 years ago, we'd be like, damn, that's that's impressive. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it is a, I, I talk about it a little bit in the book, you know, you should be proud to be an American today. You know, there is no perfect society, there never will be. Uh, and as soon as there's a perfect society, we will reject it. That's the American <laughs> nature. Uh, I mean, that's the human nature. Yeah. So, I mean, you can only strive for betterment. But we have come a, a long, long way. Um, so I, I do take offense to this idea that 
we have to focus on the most minuscule and minute situation that is unfortunate to prove some point that everything is messed up. Mm -hmm. um, and we, and I can only imagine someone who lives in a third world country watching our news thinks that we're crazy <laughs> uh, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, and, and, and we should take some appreciation. There's nothing wrong with being proud of where you come from. It doesn't matter the, the situation. That's where you're born. That's your culture and everything. And I'm proud to be an American, not as an American elitist, but I'm proud to be from here. I know that there's positives here. I know that Black Americans have contributed to American uh, society mm -hmm. since the beginning. And global and, society, man. Global and, society. I say this as a professional rapper. <laughs> yeah, as global society. And this idea that, for example, I have to reference myself as African American. Why? I'm not African. As a matter of fact, most of us have lineage that goes far beyond even the white Americans that are here. Mm -hmm. Many of them are second, third generation. You know, so why do I have to reference another continent, not even a country, but a continent? Why must I disassociate myself in, to some degree when no one else is required to do that? Um, and that I take issue with, which is why I refer to myself, if anything, as black, if you want to put me in a category. I don't like calling myself an African-American because I'm not African. And it's no diss to anybody who's from Africa, but I'm American. I'm a Westerner. You know, so I feel more comfort, for example, when I go to Europe, when I went to the UK or Germany, you know, I have friends in Germany, you know, I feel more uh, adequate there, not because I want to be some white sympathizer or that I look highly upon white people. No, I'm a Westerner. Mm -hmm. If I was to go to Nigeria, I'd stick out. My, my, how I behave and how I move is different. I'm not Nigerian. I'm not even African. I'm not from this continent. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't understand certain things and I would have to live there for a period of time to adjust to it. And that's the point. The point is that we are Americans, we're Westerners, and there's nothing wrong with that. And we've contributed to this society for a long period of time, along with everybody else. So why can't we just be that? Amen. I love that, bro. Awesome. Adam, where can people check out your book and where can people find you online? So you can uh, find my book, Black Victim to Black Victor on Amazon. Um, I also have it on Barnes & Noble if you prefer to use that. I am selling signed copies if you go to uh, wrongspeak.net. Um, you know, you can purchase it if you are in the United States, Canada, uh, signed copies on the website. But if you're outside, uh, you know, those territories, uh, feel free to contact me um, and I'll set something up and, and give you an adequate quote. Um, you can also check out just wrongspeak in general, um, wrongspeak.net for articles i try to put out one to two articles a week just being thought-provoking and deep about certain situations sometimes not even overly political but just talking about uh just wanted to be more conscious about the world around us um, and i also accept if people want to contribute so feel free to contact me if you want to just have your voice heard um, i'm on twitter you can find me at wrong underscore speak and facebook uh, you can go to facebook.com slash coleman writes and uh, you can look for wrong speak on the other free speech platforms. You'll you'll find me there. So I try to be everywhere and I try to make myself accessible for people who want to just have discussion and, and be heard. And, uh, you know, I accept criticism. I'm perfectly fine with that. Uh, you know, just, you know, be open to it back. Awesome, Adam. No doubt, man. It's been great to talk to you, bro. I think you've got a great perspective, a really interesting story. Thank and you. your book, Black Victim to Black Victor, is out now. So... Go check that out. Thank you. I am the man, sick with the slang, sick and I'm destined for fame.